very nice to have you all here and delighted to be able to uh, host this event here at King's. I've been talking with Krish about this and about the year of the Bible for a oh, year or two now, isn't it? <laughs> a couple of years. Um, as some of you may be aware, I was the person who put through the General Synod of the Church of England uh, a couple of years ago now the motion to uh, declare 2011 the year of the Bible on the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Uh, I have to say, there have been many occasions in the last few months when I really wish I hadn't. Um, the, we commended to uh, the wider church all the various activities that were going on throughout the year, um, including, therefore, all the sort of activities of Bible Fresh and so on that have all been available on the the general year of the Bible website on the 2011 Trust website and all those sorts of things. And um, I, I preached last week at Westminster Abbey, the week before that, Southwark Cathedral on, on, on Bible Sundays. You wait all year and then two cathedrals come along at once. It's like the 93 bus, you know. Um, and then on Friday we had a massive conference um, uh, with the Archbishop of Canterbury at the British Academy on the year of the Bible, King James Version, celebration or valediction. Um, and so it has been conference and, and sermons and conferences and sermons. So um, it all comes to a head next week on the course, the 16th of the 11th of 2011, uh, the service in Westminster Abbey, 16-11-2011, with the, the Archbishop of Canterbury preaching and Prince Charles present and so on. Um, and so, I mean, I really don't know where you've been all year if you haven't realized it's been the year of the Bible, what with, it's been wall-to-wall -wall, um, Melvin Bragg, uh, Jim Nochte on the Synod, all those sorts of things. Um, we had the uh, best part of a thousand biblical scholars here in Kings in July for the annual international meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature. Um, and so many other things that have been, have been happening the, um, you know, and I've been aware of a couple of things, particularly as I'm coming to conferences like, uh, like this at the end of the year, like the one on Friday, the one I was at in Windsor Great Park two weeks before that on whether it was Exodus or Revelation. Um, and I've been thinking more and more that one of the very positive things that's come out of this year has been a general appreciation of the King James Version as a work of English literature, something we... Uh, we didn't realize that there apparently there is somebody going round and placing a copy of the King James Version on every desert island. Because uh, every Friday morning, uh, the castaway is told that when they get to the desert island, they will find a copy of Shakespeare and a copy of the Bible. And I think it's assumed it's probably the King James Version that will be there already waiting for them. Um, on the other hand, I'm increasingly beginning to wonder whether... It's, uh, it is actually valediction, um, and I, I've written, I've done a lot of work on the principles of the King James Bible translators, the wonderful preface by Miles Smith, who is Bishop of Gloucester, from the translators to the reader. And, and there's been a sound of spinning that I've been hearing louder and louder as the year has gone on, which I think is Miles Smith and the translators rotating in their graves. Um, the idea that anybody would be still reading it 400 years later when they actually thought what they were trying to do was to work with the best Greek manuscripts, uh, the best scholarship of the time, and into English, which is understood even by the very vulgar. And whatever else one might say about the King James Manuscripts, it's based upon 14th century manuscripts, and its language is not necessarily understood by the very vulgar today. But it has been a fantastic opportunity to talk about renewing the Bible as a whole, and, and that's what the Bible Fresh Initiative is very much about. And um, so in my opening remarks, uh, I find myself wanting to say, okay, from the professor to the pew is what I've been asked to talk about. And I'll, I'll, I'll give, if there were two quick negative caricatures of the pew and of the professor, and then ask actually if we can do something more positive in between the two. Because one of the consequences uh, of the King James Version initially was it made the Bible look like a book. It made the Bible sound like a book. It made the Bible walk like a book. A big, nice, big set of black leather covers. And it made the Bible univocal. So that you've had centuries of people saying, well, the Bible says in the singular. 
Um, because actually, of course, as you know, the Bible contains at least 66 books, maybe more depending upon which version you've got and how many of the deuterocanonical books you've got and so on, written in a wide variety of languages, cultures, levels, and so on. But the King James Version translated them all into beautiful Jacobean prose. And all the translations subsequently translate them, smoothed it out right across the board. And so you, you have this sense that the Bible is singular, is univocal. And increasingly that meant also the use of the Bible. Once you had a nice big black leather bound book, it was very good for hitting people with. And Increasingly, I found uh, in just this year, but over the last few years, um, people are using the term unbiblical as a term which translates as, you disagree with me. Oh, that view's unbiblical. And I say, no, well, well, yeah, but there's an assumption that my view is biblical, your view by definition, therefore, is unbiblical. And I, I've looked at all the lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible, and all the lists about the uses of the Bible in 2 Timothy 3, 16, and hitting other Christians with it doesn't seem to feature in any version that I've been able to find. Um, and so I don't think that's been a very helpful development, and it's certainly very much true within the Anglican Communion and the Church of England at the moment. Um, and therefore, this attempt to be able to say, okay, I can just read off the surface uh, and, and use the Bible to say what it is I want to say and then set up my own... TV evangelist station and so on, also leads other Christians to give up on the Bible and throw out the baby with the bathwater and, and all this kind of period of post-modernism, post-evangelicalism, post this, post that or whatever, has led to um, a crisis of confidence also in the Bible among our pews. On the other hand, if I go back to any kind of basic communication theory, um, when I did my PhD work, I worked particularly on, on Roman Jacobson's communication theory that all communication requires um, a transmitter and a receiver. So that, you know, you've got, I live in Highgate, not very far away from the Alley Pally uh, transmitter, and of course that, they had Crystal Palace on the other side to be able to transmit across the London Bowl. And you've got to have a receiver that's tuned in to do it. You know, you, you can only get television pictures on a television. You can only get radio, radio broadcasts on a radio. There are those of us who think the pictures are better on the radio, but you see what I mean. And, and therefore, in any kind of communication, there is author, text, and reader. There is transmitter, communication, receiver. Uh, there's a production company, film, audience, and so on. And if we think about that in terms of how we handle the scriptures, obviously the word author contains author or authors, editors, translators, those who transmitted it down through the centuries and those who've produced our various texts and our translations and so on. Especially since we don't actually know who the human authors of many of the books of the Bible actually were. But secondly, the idea of reader, you have to bear in mind that Silent reading, as we do it, most of the way in which we were, most of which we were brought up to receive the Bible, was by silent reading on your own, reading it through the eyes in your head. Now that's a relatively recent phenomenon. Please bear in mind, I read ancient history and classics at Oxford, and the, the definition of the gap of modern is when the legions left in 411. So when I say relatively recent. Um, I'm talking still centuries. Uh, it, it really does get going, particularly at the Reformation, as a consequence of the mass printing of Bibles. And it's one of the great things about the King James Version was that it was uh, the King James Version and the Geneva Bible before it were able to be printed in quantities for individuals to be able to read. But even then, very often, it would be read at home by the head of the family, family prayers and so on. People would still receive it through the ears more than through the eyes. So when we talk about author, text, and reader, the word audience is a much better word, for, certainly for the ancient world, and certainly up to about the 17th century, because it's about hearing. And as we move through the technological revolution that we're in at the moment with information technology, away from being a printed culture and into a visual YouTube culture and so on, increasingly, um, it, it is about an issue of being heard. 
And then in between, of course, author text reader is the text. And I've already indicated that the whole point about the text, ta biblia, is a plural word, plurality of books and backgrounds. And through the 19th and 20th centuries, the whole development, the history of biblical criticism grew up with a, a wide range of ways in which to do um, tools and so on to look and analyze the Bible. And that was seen as maybe perhaps a counterbalance from the professor to the naive or simplistic reading in the pew, or a counterbalance to the development in the 19th century of what we then know as the fundamentalist tradition. And that raises, therefore, in literary theory, the issue about whether the Bible, whether any kind of text, uh, how it functions. And traditionally, scholarship, both biblical scholarship and ancient scholarship, sees a text as a window, a window through which we look to that which lies beyond, behind, or the other side of it. Um, and the whole point, obviously, is that after 2,000 years, the windows have got rather smeared and dirty, and there have been the accretions over the period and so on. And so the, the idea with the attempt was to clean the window off by removing the accretions of the last 2,000 years, to be able to look through it, to be able to see the historical Jesus or the early Christian communities and so on. And any of you who've done any formal biblical studies will be quite familiar with the long list of the words with the word criticism after it. Uh, textual criticism, source criticism, form criticism, redaction criticism, composition criticism, rhetorical criticism, structuralist criticism, feminist criticism, gay criticism, etc., etc., etc. And of course, that immediately that then raises the question from the pew uh, to the professor, how dare you criticize the word of God? Maybe criticism isn't the correct word. I mean, in, in the German, I'm sure most of you know, there, there is the word Geschichte, which means some form of history form Geschichte, or Geschichte, and so on, get translated into is his criticism. I'll come in a moment to the most exciting and recent development of those tools, Wirkungsgeschichte. I'm sure you all lie awake at night thinking of little else. The problem is that for some people, this, the, the experience of the professor doing that is, well, what is the metaphor you're doing? I described it as peeling away the layers that get in the way. And in a lot of um, uh, analogy of, of a lot of these tools, the idea is that what we're doing is removing the outer husk so that we can get to the kernel inside, so we can get to the solid gold nugget of the words of Jesus or whatever. So that's why we're peeling away the outer layers. But for many people, the experience is not one of peeling away the outer layers to get to the husk. It's more like an onion. You keep peeling away layers until there's nothing left but tears. And so, actually, I want to suggest that um, that conspiracy of pew and pulpit, neither one's actually helping us terribly much because uh, the naive surface reading causes people to give up on the Bible. Equally, uh, a large amount of academic biblical study, um, particularly for those who are training for ministry or whatever, and they go to theological college, it's something they have to endure, and they give up the minute uh, that they get ordained. You can always tell when the vicar got ordained by looking at the date of the last book in their bookshelf, you know, that, that kind of thing. Now, is text really a window through which we look to that which lies beyond, behind, or the other side of it? Yes, it can be used in that kind of way. Um, but on the other hand, I'm sure many of you are very familiar um, with the sorts of cafes and things you get. I mean, I live in Islington, and there's all those sort of cafes where... Tony Blair and Gordon Brown decided who was going to run the country, that kind of place. And, and you go into the cafe and you, it's packed out and you can see uh, a spare table over in the far right-hand corner. So you head off to it quickly and halfway there you get brought up very short. Um, you bang actually into a mirrored wall. <laughs> and you discover that actually the cafe is only half the size you thought it was. Um, and this, all that stuff is actually merely a reflection in the mirrored wall, and the table you thought was over on the far right-hand side is actually merely a reflection of one that's on the left-hand side, and while you were going this way, somebody else just went and nicked it. Now, that's a good example of confusing what you think lies beyond, behind the other side, 
with actually the reflection of something that's in front of it. And those of you that are familiar, for instance, with the work of Tony Thistleton will know that what I'm talking about is the premature assimilation of horizons in his great book, The Two Horizons, and so on. The point being that unreflective study says, okay, I've got some basic biblical knowledge, I do some tools, and this is what I see, and you know, I can then you know, get that idea and it, it informs my preaching and so on. And if you don't realize that what actually is happening quite a lot of the time is just the mere reflection back off the text of your previous views and prejudices, all that's happening is you are reinforcing your prior ideas, but now with the added extra ingredient that God agrees with me. So now I can go and set up my uh, Bible uh, TV evangelist stuff and hit people with it and so on. And, and so that's why actually both of these uh, elements, I, I, I find uh, pulpit, pro, uh, pro, professor, pew, pulpit, whatever, not necessarily helpful. We need to have, of course, both. We need to have the search for God. We need to be able to study the scriptures with prayer and with inspiration. And we also need scholarship and hard work and perspiration, if I can put it in that way which is where prayer and wisdom and humility and the seeking the assistance of the Spirit comes into play. So what kind of things might actually the Academy help the church with the Bible? Well, the first is the thing I've already talked about is the issue of the plurality, just to recognize that the Bible is a plural noun. It's not a book. It's a library. It's a library of at least 66 books, and depending on whether you follow the Jewish method of knowing or the Roman Catholic or the Orthodox, it could be quite a number more books as well. And it's a library over a thousand years, written in a variety of different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. It spans a whole variety of different sorts of cultures. Just think of the nomadic lifestyle of the patriarchs where clearly some of the things you're going to be concerned about is grazing rights, water rights. Can I bring my flocks to uh, this, this well or, or whatever? Very different from a settled agricultural community once you have uh, stable villages and towns growing up in Israel-Palestine. And then the growth of cities. So the development of urban affairs, where instead of just having your own flocks and doing your own hunter-gathering or doing your own uh, harvesting and so on, you're buying and selling in the marketplace. So if water rights are important, say, for the nomadic patriarchs, for an agricultural community, boundary stones are really important. And the guy who moves the boundary stone in the middle of the night makes his field a little bit larger. We see that, obviously, in the Bible. But when you get to the city, it's going to be issues to do with weights and measures and the trade in the marketplace and who's making a profit and all of that. And that's still the concern that we have in the city at the moment as the St. Paul's um, report is published today. And then overlaying all of that, of course, the great imperial cultures of the ancient Near East, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Seleucids, the Romans and on through to the imperial cultures that we know today. So you've got a variety of kind of cultural settings going on. And to treat the Bible as though it's just one book from out of one setting, again, is to ignore the great richness that God has given us. There's a variety of styles. Um, one of the smoothing effects of the King James, as I mentioned already, was to make them all speak in 17th century Jacobean prose. If you actually just read, say, Mark's Gospel and Luke's Gospel next door to one another in the Greek, it's completely different. Mark uh, is written in Polish, really, or, um, uh, you know, the way in which we've got lots of different Englishes now in the, in the capital, where you can see that people are actually recognizing speaking in their original, or thinking in their original language, even though they're perfectly fluent in English, but the word order and so on reflects German, Polish, Nigerian, or whatever. And Mark is quite clearly thinking in Hebrew Aramaic, therefore he begins every sentence and, because that's the very thing you do in Hebrew Aramaic, 
Um, but of course, he uses the even the wrong Greek word "and." He says "kai ha Jesus" instead of saying "ha de Jesus," because the, the, the and um, uh, so it's very poor Greek. And the other thing that's clear about Mark, for instance, is he's very, very fond of what we call the historic present. For instance, you know sometimes when you're on the bus and there are two old ladies sitting in front of you and they're talking about something in the present tense. So I says to her, and she says to me, and it's all very lively, exciting, interesting, but you, and you can't help overhearing and you realize that what they're talking about is something that happened before the war and you're not sure which war. Um, and that idea of describing past events in the present, the historic present, Mark does it 151 times in, in his relatively short book. He, he uses a present tense for a past event. Well, the occasional use of it can be quite dramatic. The constant use of it, well, the translator said, oh, bloody hell. Mark's Greek is just so bad, so we just, we'll just, you know, correct it into the past tense. And so you, you have Mark, as it sounds beautifully, particularly in the King James Version, delivered by Alec McCowan. But there's no relation to the actual uh, English of Mark. On the other hand, you come across to Luke, and here's a, guy, here's a real Greek stylist. And he begins in those opening chapters of Luke's Gospel with Zechariah in the temple and uh, the Annunciation to Mary and Elizabeth having John the Baptist and so on. And he writes in Septuagintal Greek. He writes in Greek with a pronounced Hebrew accent, but writing proper Septuagintal Greek, i.e. the Greek of the translation of the Old Testament, which was known as the Septuagint, from the, the old story that 70 people, hence the Latin word Septuagint, were all uh, shut up in 70 different rooms um, to translate the Old Testament. And when they all came out, they'd all written exactly the same. And that, and that was proof not of copying, but of divine inspiration in those days. Um, wouldn't work in an exam board here today, I'm afraid. Um, but as Luke tells his story, and particularly as he gets through into Acts, the Greek changes. It's still quite septic into it in Jerusalem, but by the time he gets to Athens, and certainly by the time he gets to Rome, he's writing much, much more classical Greek because he's, he's actually very cleverly evoking the atmosphere of Paul in Athens, talking Athenian Greek, as opposed to Septuagintal Greek when it's in Jerusalem. And again, it's very hard to actually reflect that in an English translation. And so that's where we, we end up with this smoothing effect, where actually there is plurality in the canon. And I've been privileged in the last few weeks spending quite a bit of time, as I do from time to time, with, with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It was his 80th birthday, and I was out in Cape Town representing the Archbishop of Canterbury, at the launch uh, of a new big biography there and um, his birthday service and so on. And we had him back here for dinner a couple of weeks ago. And of course, one of his phrases is the rainbow people of God. And, you know, I do think that God is slightly more interesting than Henry Ford. You know, you can have every color you like as long as it's black. You know, there, there is in the Bible this extraordinary gift of plurality and diversity. And we actually miss that very often, with a sort of univocal sense of it. So therefore, we've got to be sensitive to this variety of languages, cultures, styles, and then of genres in our library. There's poetry, there's prose, there's novel, there's drama, there's pithy proverbs, there's accounts of kings and rulers, there are letters, there are oracles, there are prophecies, there are biographies, there are histories. But even in a, when they are biographies or histories or novels, they are written according to the conventions of their day, not according to our conventions of biography or history or novel and so on. So, for instance, if I was to say to you, uh, good evening, here is the news, uh, you would immediately expect to hear uh, about the latest developments in the M5 crash. You'd hear about the report that's published today about St. Paul's, and they'd bring on a banker to say one sort of views, and they'd bring on protesters to say something else. They'd be talking about um, the euro or whatever, and they'd bring on a conservative to give a, uh, a one view, and then they'd bring on a liberal who would then say exactly the same. No, some, well, that's, not, that's not quite. Anyway. You, there's fairness and there's balance and there's all of that sort of thing. 
If I were to say, once upon a time, you would expect to hear about knights in shining armor, damsels in distress, and you're not going to worry if the dragon's side of the story doesn't get equally fair and balanced treatment, yeah? What you've just done is genre criticism. You, are, you interpret a news broadcast as though it was a news broadcast. You interpret a fairy story as though it was a fairy story. We distinguish between news broadcasts and fairy stories. At least we did until Murdoch started taking over everything with cable. Um, so the whole point is that you have to understand what the genre of something that you are reading actually is. So that, for instance, when it says in the Psalms, uh, the sun comes out of his tent in the morning like a bridegroom rejoicing, Please give the psalmist enough credit. He didn't really think there was a bloody great tent the other side of the mountains where the sun went at night. It's poetry. It's not a scientific textbook. And, you know, in Swallows and Amazons, uh, which I used to love reading to my children, I mean, if you remember this sort of bunch of various middle-class kids sailing boats around um, the Lake District between the wars. There's a wonderful bit because they've all got flags. And, of course, my children didn't really understand why they needed flags to communicate, why they just didn't use their mobile phones was the, was the obvious point. Um, but you can do two things with flags. You know, you can put flags in different configurations, which is semaphore, or you can give them long flaps and short flaps and do it in Morse. And there's a real problem when they meet some other kids, because they all, Swallows and Amazons all use semaphore, and Dot and Dorothea use Morse. And although they've got the same flags, they can't communicate because they don't understand the code. And therefore, using the right code, decoding in that sense, is really, really important. And therefore, we have to understand what kind of culture a book of the Bible has come out of, what kind of style it's written, and what sort of genre it is. So that, for instance, um, I take Genesis uh, chapter 1 and the opening chapter, I, I take them literally. And I, 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 I resist anybody else who says, oh, you don't take Genesis literally. No, I, I take them literally. I interpret them according to their litera, according to their letters, according to their literature, and they're clearly written as theology and poetry to explain really important truths. Why is there a world at all? What's, uh, what, what's the relationship between human beings and the created order? What's the relationship between men and women? What's the relationship between human beings and God? Why is it when every time you say to a human being, don't, you can do anything except that, they always go and do the that? Um, and all those sorts of questions, it's not designed to be a physics textbook. And actually to interpret it as though it were a physics textbook has started to be the habit relatively, only relatively recently in the 19th century, is not to take it literally at all. It's actually to interpret the news broad, the fairy story as though it was a news broadcast or the psalm as though it was a science uh, astronomy book and so on. So we've got to be sensitive to this plurality, to this library, and we've got to try, therefore, to read it. And that really does mean... Uh, reading the different books. One of the other sort of byproducts of the King James Version was that they, they set every verse as a separate paragraph. So every verse is, in, is individually set with a little paragraph mark in front of it. And, and again, verses and chapters are relatively recent, 13th century. The original manuscripts don't even have full stops, commas, spaces between the words. It's all, the original, the first manuscripts are all written in capital letters on 35 foot long scrolls with no gaps between the words at all. So all that kind of thing you look at when you think, when you look at a page of the Bible, the two columns and nice big numbers and the little, that, that's all been added in. And the temptation therefore was that it actually produced a culture which does chapter and verse. Oh, you need to give me chapter and verse on that is a way of saying, actually, I, I, I need the evidence for it. Even though chapter and verse was never part of the way in which God gave the scriptures originally. Now, if you want to get theories of whether chapter and verse were also inspired by God, well, we can discuss that later or whatever. You know, and within uh, certain sections, um, I mean, Ian Paisley or various other American groups and so on, do believe that the King James Version was verbally inspired even more than the original manuscripts. No, seriously. Um, now, as 
the King James moved into the revisions that were done by the revised version, the RSV, the NRSV, and then the, then the explosion of other families of translations, the New English Bible coming out of the sort of 1960s Oxford and Cambridge liberalism, uh, the Jerusalem Bible coming out of the Roman Catholic uh, restudying of the Bible, the NIV coming out of the evangelical tradition, and so on. Um, they produce it, tend, tend to produce it in, in bite-sized chunks with still little sort of italics at the top and so on. And if you grew up uh, in an Anglican or Catholic tradition, you'll be used to the lectionary where, again, the passages are read on a regular daily basis and on a Sunday basis in paragraphs. If, if not, if you grew up with every day with Selwyn Hughes, then equally you will be used to having it in bite-sized chunks. That's not how the Bible books would have been received by and large uh, to begin with. They were, uh, ancient works were read as a totality. The whole point about a scroll, 35 foot long scroll, is it takes about an hour and a half to be read out loud. And I've already referred to uh, Alec McCowan's public um, recitation of the text of the King James Version of, the, of Mark's Gospel that he put on the West End stage in the 1970s. That was a complete revelation. One of the great things actually about the Bible year is that we've had all over the country public readings of, of the Bible, sometimes King James and sometimes not others, whole books or even the whole book, of the whole, all of the Bible together. And one of the things that I try to encourage people to do if you are using the Revised Common Lectionary, which at least, you know, where you follow Matthew all the way through year A or Mark all the way through year B and uh, Luke all the way through year C, Similarly, if you come out of, out of a more free church tradition where you, you take a book of the Bible and you preach your way through it Sunday by Sunday and by Sunday, is to say, well, before you start doing that, organize some event where the whole book is actually read out loud at a single sitting. So people actually hear the whole of the epistle to the Romans. And it doesn't take that long, about an hour, um, uh, at a single sitting or the gospel or, or whatever. Have an evening, um, provide some refreshments part way through or whatever. And just get the sense of actually how this book would have been heard, how it would have been received by an audience, uh, we know, rather than the sort of way in which people mumble their way through the Bible. And this is the word of the Lord. And you think, no, it's not. God has much more interesting things to say. <laughs> and therefore, that means read it in its original context. You know, the, the chapter and verse culture of the King says gave you a chance to take the text out of its context. And you all know that a text without its context is usually being used as a pretext uh, and often to hit somebody else with. And then read it in the canonical context. What happens when this particular portion of Scripture, what, what, how does it work in the, um, in the flow of the particular book, and how does that work within the whole kind of canon of Scripture in total? So that, for instance, if you look at the Caesarea Philippi episode in Mark's Gospel, uh, where, you know, Jesus says, who do people say I am? It clearly functions as the turning point in the middle of Mark's Gospel, uh, after which everything moves down towards Jerusalem. But actually, it's preceded by uh, the healing of the blind man who doesn't see everything straight first time. And then we, it's followed by the transfiguration and various other things. And then we have the healing uh, of a blind man who does see straight. And there is this sort of book ending almost as though that, um, you know, why does Jesus have to do a second touch to the guy uh, beforehand? And from that, you know, you can get second blessing theology if you want. Certainly Matthew and Mark didn't include that story because it doesn't look terribly good that Jesus doesn't get it right first time, so that's left out by Matthew and Mark. But I quite like the idea that, that you see, we see it with Peter. You know, who do you say? Well, you're the Christ. Well done, Peter. You can see it. And I'm going to go to Jerusalem to die. No, you're not. Blah, 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 blah. And then Peter has to be, have a smack around the head and says, look, you're still seeing things rather blurred. Let's get it into sharper focus. I'm, you know, Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem to die. And then it comes into much greater clarity with the healing of the other blind man. So the way in which a passage functions in the flow of a particular book and the way in which that book functions within the whole of the Bible. Then there is also, of course, um, the fact that so much of us, when we're reading the Bibles, think that, you know, 
we pick up the Bible and think nothing's happened to it since uh, St. John the Divine wrote the last verse of Revelation and just ignore the last 2,000 years. But actually, whether that's both from a scholarly point of view or from the more naive or pew reading eyes, they jump from the last page of Revelation to today. But increasingly, one of them, I mean, I talked earlier about the various forms of Geschichte, this and that Geschichte, or this and that criticism. And, and over the last 10, 15 years, particularly within biblical studies, we've been talking a lot about this word Wirkungsgeschichte, which basically um, is impact criticism or effect criticism. The, the, cor the, the, the correct English translation of it as reception history doesn't really have the, the impact I want. How was this passage uh, read in the early church, in the debates of the great councils, by the Celts, by the, you know, with, with wonderful illuminated manuscripts, by the medieval period, the art and architecture, Michelangelo, Bach, and so on, in the day commerce with the Archbishop of Canterbury, on, um, on last Friday, uh, we were talking about the fact, you know, uh, that well-known theologian and devotee of the King James Bible, Richard Dawkins, um, <laughs> describes belief in God as like believing in the tooth fairy, to which Archbishop Rowan pointed out the tooth fairy has not yet produced the B minor mass, the works of Michelangelo, <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, and so on. <laughs> uh, how has the, these Bible passages been understood and interpreted by theologians, preachers, artists, musicians, architects down through the last 2,000 years? Read the passage you're looking at in its literary context, like any other good story. Look particularly at how narrative, if it's a narrative passage, how narrative functions, the plot, the tension, the characters, the way in which, uh, say, the opponents of Jesus are being characterized in a particular way, the way in which the followers of Jesus are being characterized in a particular way, the way all of that leads to a climax. Look at the way in which each of the four uh, Gospels tell the story of the crucifixion as the culmination of their particular portraits of Jesus uh, along, along the way. Um, Mark's Jesus is very dark and very riddling, and it leads to, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, going unanswered. Matthew sets it very much in the Jewish kind of context, and my God, my God, forsaken, why have you forsaken me, is answered by the earthquake, the wind, and all the ways in which that happen in the Old Testament when God turns up. Um, Luke has been talking all about women and outsiders and showing Jesus the man of prayer and all of that. And at the cross, Jesus prays for the women of Jerusalem. He prays for forgiveness for the soldiers and the carpenters who have to tie him to a, or nail him to a cross. He, he brings the penitent thief into the, into the kingdom, and he dies with prayer on his lips. Whereas in John's gospel, um, where throughout the whole story, Jesus has been in control, uh, even if the rest of the world doesn't quite realize it. Again, from the great Johannine idea of the Deus Regnat ex lignio, God is, is you know, reigning from the wood. The, the, sometimes when you see the crucifixes of, of Jesus in, in kingly robes and crown on the cross, as a sort of definition of John's theology, um, so that he can um, sort out who's going to look after his mother and, and die with a cry that says, it is accomplished, and so on. So see how the plot lines work. How, how, like any other good kind of story and so on. And here in the chapel, for instance, these, the four windows of the, two, of the four evangelists, either side of the two Marys here, um, has the, the traditional symbols of the lion, the ox, the eagle, the human face inspiring the evangelists. And those of you who know my work know that you know, my book, Four Gospels, One Jesus, is an attempt to, to do that. And try to make use, therefore, also of all the world of biblical scholarship. There are plenty of commentaries which are designed to try to bring from the professor to the pew, from the scholarship to uh, the life of the church, for instance. Obviously, some of the commentaries are uh, going to be so full of Greek or Hebrew or whatever and are looking purely at the literary or the historical side. But for something like the Bible Reading Fellowship, um, commentaries which I was the general editor of the BRF PBC series um, when we were trying to write um, 
the stuff that's going to go on the back of the commentaries, I said, well, it's from around the world and across the denominations, and we want to instruct the head and warm the heart. Uh, what we were looking for were uh, academics who could take um, vast amounts of scholarship and, and, and get it in a way that was actually helpful for people in the pew. J.B. Phillips, the great Bible translator, um, described working on the Bible as being like an electrician trying to rewire an old house without being able to turn the electricity off. <laughs> and every now and again, you're up in the loft and it's all very dusty and it all looks very dead and suddenly you get a shock because what you've just got hold of is live. And in relation to us actually, you know, working out... Um, how we can read the Bible, there is the question about how the Bible reads us. How we let it be live. How we get a shock. How does it challenge us as we look for the person of Jesus in the middle of it all. We often refer to the Bible as the Word of God, but please bear in mind that John chapter 1 is very clear that the, word, the real word of God is Jesus of Nazareth, God incarnate in a human life. And we look for that incarnate word in the written words. Or as it says in the Collect for Bible Sunday that we were reading uh, in, in my tradition every day for the last week, that we might so read, mark, and inwardly digest. My unusual prayer before I preach is to say, to ask God to pour out his spirit, to breathe, move, and inspire written and spoken words that we might behold the living word, Jesus Christ. Or to go to what Miles Smith, Bishop of Gloucester, says at the end of his preface at the King James Version, that it is an extraordinary thing when God calls to say, here I am I, here we are ready to do your will, O oh Lord. Well, we'll gather a few questions and then throw them over Rich's way. First question revolves around, uh, we've got all these different translations. Uh, here we are on the brink of, uh, you know, 2012. Where should we be going forward? Which one should we focus on uh, at the moment? Okay, good. Uh, another question we want, we want to raise? Uh, yes, at the back there, yes. Does the Bible still have prophecy for today? Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Brilliant. So, uh, similar to the first question, but is there one particular translation that manages to kind of bring the nuance out of those different uh, voices uh, in the biblical authors? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you're giving a Bible to someone who's never read the Bible before, uh, what kind of Bible would you give them if they're just an ordinary kind of English speaker? Great. Uh, Richard, are you ready to take some of those? Yeah, thank you. Um, let me take the first, the third, and the fourth together, first of all. I, this question about multiplicity of different translations and what should we be giving to people and, and, and uh, which one should we be using and so on. Um, I have to say that throughout the year, as, I've, as I mentioned earlier, I've become more and more convinced that actually uh, really... Sit, 2011 ought to be the last time anybody reads from the King James Version in church. Uh, I mean, you know, and I say that with a heavy heart, but, um, you know, the, the more I have worked on particularly the, the translator's prefaces, where they're very, very clear that the Bible is first and foremost the inestimable word of God. It is scripture. It is a sacred thing. I mean, let me let you into a little secret. These guys really could barely speak English. Uh, Branthwaite, one of the translators, had a wonderful library, 1,400 books in his library for that day. One of those books was in English. It was a poem called The Spider and the Fly. <laughs> the other 1,399 books were in proper scholarly languages, Latin, Hebrew, Greek, French, Italian, and so on. John Boyce, one of the other translators, writes, wrote his diary and his notes uh, every day. 
and he writes all his notes in Latin, but of course dropping into Greek when discussing the Greek text or dropping into Hebrew when discussing the Hebrew text and just moves seamlessly in the grammar as he does so. Uh, the way in which they worked was that they were, they were very clear that they were told to make a good one better. Um, and they were instructed to start with the bishop's Bible. Um, and so they were like a bunch of poets at a poetry reading, really. It was all about how it sounds. So the little companies, somebody would, they would look at a particular verse and somebody would read out the verse and the others would just sit in silence and listen to it while they had open in front of them the Greek and the Hebrew. And then they might look at, they were also, that was rule number one was they must follow the text of the Bishop's Bible as much as possible. Rule number 14 allowed them, or rule number four, was four, I think it was, sorry, um, allowed them also to look at Tyndale, Matthew, Coverdale, uh, Geneva Bible, even the Douay Reims, which was the Roman Catholic translation from the Vulgate into English. And, you know, as somebody who sits on a lot of church committees, I often wondered uh, how on earth this committee of over 50 people moving in six companies produced something as, as memorable as this, because church committees don't normally write anything as nice as this. And the answer is that about 80% of it really is still Tyndale, you know, the great phrases we all know. Um, but they, they saw it primarily as scripture, not as a work of English literature. They saw it primarily as something improving what had gone before. Um, and, you know, one or two times this year when people have said, oh, we're celebrating for 400 years of the Bible in English, I'd say, no, we had 150 years in which, certainly for the first part of that period, people like Tyndale were, were died uh, to get the Bible into English and, and, and Wycliffe and his followers and so on. Um, and we'd had the Regis Professors of Greek and Hebrew in Oxford and Cambridge for about a hundred years before that. So it was building upon all of this work. And they, they, they wanted it to be out of the original sacred tongues, and they were working with um, Erasmus's edition of the New Testament, which is based upon 12th, 13th century manuscripts. Well, you know, we now have 2nd, 3rd, 4th century manuscripts and so on, so a huge change in the, in the manuscripts. And they wanted to make it into uh, the ordinary English. Actually, even in its own day, it was already fairly archaic. I mean, because you were talking about a bunch of uh, Oxford and Cambridge academics who could, who thought in Latin and Greek anyway, and they were tending to use the bio, the translations that had gone before them. So it was fairly archaic. For instance, um, by the end of the 16th century, by 1599, 1600, uh, it was increasingly recognized that we needed a non-gender specific third person pronoun, it. Um, and it's possessive, it's. The King James Version hardly ever, if ever, uses it's. Sometimes of it, but more often not, if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Um, it is much, much more masculine in its translation than even English was in 1611, and certainly much, much more masculine than the Greek and the Hebrew is. Atis anakos lutheto, if any one will follow, in the King James, if any man will follow. And so one of the interesting things we're doing today when we talk about making uh, our translations more gender inclusive, actually that reflects certainly the Greek and the Hebrew a lot more and, and, and so on. So the RV, uh, the revised version, which was a deliberate attempt to say, okay, we will do what the King James translators were doing. We will revise it, make it better, but we'll take into account the new translation, the new manuscripts we've found, or the very old manuscripts we have recently found. And then in 1901, the American Standard Version came out um, with a lot of changes that American scholars had wanted, which they had respectfully submitted to the revised version company, which met in the Jerusalem Chamber at Westminster Abbey. And they were rather poo-poo these things from the colonials. Um, and in the sort of debate afterwards, the, you could see the center of power beginning to shift across the Atlantic. The Revised Standard Version, uh, again, was an attempt to revise it in the light of more recent discoveries. And the new Revised Standard Version is another revision again, uh, particularly in the case that the, the text of the New Testament has changed enormously between the King James and the RSV. The text of the Old Testament, not very much, because we're working primarily with the Masoretic text. 
since the Second World War, the Dead Sea Scrolls, lots of developments in uh, Hebrew Bible studies have made us realize actually a lot of has gone on with the text of the Hebrew Bible since the Second World War, which is reflected in the New, in the new Revised Standard. So moving towards the question, which translation should we be using? If you value the King James tradition, you should be using the new RSV. That is the, the best scholarly um, uh, translation of, an inter of the international community drawing upon the best scholar manuscripts we've got and so on today. In terms of the issue about different styles, the nearest we've got to that is that in the new RSV, they have pointed out that they have written the Old Testament in a slightly higher style than the New Testament. Now, bear in mind what the new RSV calls a slightly lower style is much higher than most of us talk. <laughs> but, for instance, they distinguish between shall and will in the Old Testament, um, but not in the new there's an indication of, of, of dropping their style in, in that kind of way. The, the other families, as I've said, are, are translations from scratch, and they, they tend to come out of their different communities, as I indicated. The, so you, you've got the New English Bible, Revised English Bible, coming out of, out of a 60s liberal tradition. You've got the Jerusalem Bible, the New Jerusalem Bible, coming out of a Catholic tradition. You've got the NIV, and today's NIV, coming out of a more evangelical tradition. You've got the Good News uh, good news for modern man, as it then was, um, and the today's English version. So the issue about giving a Bible to someone, what version should you give, there is no single answer. What is their reading age? What newspaper do they read? If they tend to read the tabloids, then give them the good news. Um, if they're reading the broadsheets or something, then, yeah, uh, NIV, Jerusalem, or whatever, uh, or, or the New Revised Standard Version. Which one should we be using? Well, if you've not got Greek and Hebrew, use them all. Look and compare and contrast at the different sorts of versions. Um, if you happen to speak uh, a modern European language, have a, ha have a German or a Spanish or a French, just to, just to hear that it in a slightly different kind of while. So, so there's, a, there's, there's variety uh, uh, to there. And um, uh, there really isn't, I'm afraid, a translation that reflects the kind of, of variety of style that I was talking about. And that was one of the things that came out of the conference uh, on, on Friday. Does the Bible still have prophecy for today? Yes, provided you understand what the word prophecy means. Um, pro fami, I speak out. I speak on behalf of another. Not necessarily, I tell the future. Biblical prophecy is not actually about um, a kind of Christian version of um, clairvoyance or tense or, 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 or whatever. It is, it is to look at what is going on and to speak on behalf of God and reveal what is, what is happening. And uh, the vast majority of biblical prophecy is not about for, it's about forth telling rather than for telling. Um, and so, yes, uh, you can, I mean, I, I would not read the book of Revelation as a road map for the next 2,000 years um, so that we can say, you know, that guy that wanted to say when the end of the, the world was going to be twice this year. I mean, the, the history is littered with people who misinterpret in that way. The book of Revelation, standing in the tradition of the book of Daniel, standing in apocalyptic, takes a, reveals, takes away the veil. Apocalypso uncovers the veil and says, behind all these human empires, there is the cosmic struggle between good and evil, between God and those who are in rebellion against him. And we need that prophetic word from Revelation just as much in the middle of the Eurozone crisis as at any other time. But don't go trying to say, oh, well, the ten heads of Daniel is the, is the ten members of the common market and all that. <laughs> Tempting. I'm going to have to pause you there. Uh, thank you very much for uh, those answers. Very helpful. Uh, some of the questions we could spill over into the uh, afternoon session.